You could say, I live in the middle of nowhere. I prefer to call it the middle of the wilderness, though. And after living alone out here long enough, I thought I'd become familiar with the land out here and even get comfortable. But I've never gotten comfortable. Maybe used to this place, but never comfortable. I'm pretty sure I can hold my own out here for the time being. But even so, lots of weird shit happens out here. I'm glad to finally have a way to tell strangers who probably won't judge or call me crazy, though. Back to the topic at hand. Weird stuff. I'll start with the first odd experience I had here. When I first purchased this land, I was really excited. There was already a house on the property that was the perfect size for me. Not only that, but it seemed pretty new. Like, the former owners didn't stay around very long. Yeah, yeah, red flags, but how was I supposed to know how messed up this place was? Anyway, I move in without any issues, and within a week, I'm out on some of the trails that were already there, looking for deer tracks and other game trails. I'm actually having a pretty relaxing time, until I swear I hear a baby say, Mama, in the most stereotypical voice I've ever heard off in the distance. Now, like I said, I'm here in the middle of nowhere, so there shouldn't be anyone for miles. I just shook it off as me hearing things. Twenty minutes later, though, I heard the same voice say mama again. Only this time, it's forty yards away on the other side of some trees and brush. It didn't even sound like a real baby. It just sounded like some disturbed dude. Of course, at this point, he's definitely on my property as well. I start making my way through the undergrowth, and then when I'm sure I'm about to hit where he was, and the brush opens up to a clearing, I finally get a glimpse of the guy. He was butt naked and halfway behind a tree, and flaunting a huge smile with his eyes staying kind of squinty. He was also pretty skinny as I could see his ribs. Now, usually you hear people say that, at this moment my blood ran cold, but honestly, mine didn't. I was looking at some butt-naked crackhead trespassing on my property. He decided to let out another mama during the silence when I was trying to figure out my next move. So I promptly responded with a hearty, What the actual hell are you doing? And that's when he decided my next move for me. He started running at me, and I might have run away if he hadn't been so scrawny. So when he reached me with that big smile and looked like he was about to grab me, I punched him in the throat. It was a good punch. I was proud of it, honestly. It would have kept any normal man on the ground for at least a minute. And this is when I got the first hint that this wasn't a normal man. While I was standing there, proud of my Mike Tyson-level haymaker, the guy immediately got back to his feet, and before I had time to hit him again, he dive-tackled me to the ground. It hurt something awful. He somehow pinned my shoulders to the ground, and no matter how hard I kicked and punched him, he wouldn't let up. And so I was forced to use plan B. I pulled out my trusty Bear grill survival knife and stabbed him in the gut twice. This finally got his attention, and he hopped back to his feet, slinging blood all over me in the process. I got back to my feet, knife in hand, and waited for him to do something else. All he did was stick a finger in his wound, and then lick the blood off, and then cartwheel into the woods crying like an actual newborn baby this time. Now, by this point, I was pretty on edge, and right as he got far enough away, I could no longer hear him. I turned and walked home. I know, I know, I should have run, but running through the woods is so tiring and I just didn't feel like it. When I got home, all was normal again. For a while, at least. Another story that comes to mind when I think about odd things happening around the area is the event that led me to no longer camp in my woods. By the time that the events in this story took place, I had already experienced quite a few things on this property, and this was easily the third freakiest thing to happen up to that point, right behind the naked stab victim that cried like a newborn baby and cartwheeled into the woods. This time, I decided that I wanted to go camping, Despite all the stuff that had happened, I had never been seriously injured in those woods, so why not go sleep in them? Bad choice, I know. Anyways, 
The first few hours when I got into the woods went fine. I set up camp, built a fire, burned myself trying to cook a hot dog, then pissed on the fire that burned me. And then I started to realize, camping's pretty boring when you're all alone. So I decided to go to sleep. Next thing I know, I wake up to the sound of a young girl's voice down in the creek. It sounds like she's from college age type. She's saying, help, I need some help down here, I'm lost. Dad, help. And I can hear her down in the creek from my tent. Now this isn't the first time I've been lured into the woods by a voice pleading for help, but this voice was a lot more convincing than the others. Nonetheless, I still brought my newly purchased 45 caliber handgun that I had bought for dealing with the things on the land. I made my way into the creek, a flashlight in hand, and headed down to the voice. Soon I found the source. Now, I didn't put the flashlight beam on her right away because I didn't want to blind her, but I could clearly see the outline of a small girl sitting on the bank of the creek. I got about 15 feet away and she stopped me, stating that, You don't really need that flashlight with the moon out like this. It wasn't even close to a full moon, so that confused me a little. So I replied with, I don't know about you, but I can't see a thing out here. Let me help you though. Are you hurt? And then I started to shine the flashlight on her, but she screamed stop before I got to her face. This time, the voice wasn't as convincing. I could tell she wasn't human. Now, what you guys need to realize is that I'm not a badass and I'm not trying to sound cool or tough. But ever since something happened three years ago, the same event that caused me to move out here, I don't respond to situations the same anymore. I don't know, maybe I'm not as scared of death, maybe I'm mentally unstable, maybe I'm weird. But when I established that this thing wasn't human, I started to smile. It fooled me, got me out here in the woods, in its domain, and was probably going to make an attempt on my life. But I might as well piss it off a little. So I flicked my flashlight up and revealed its face. It actually was a girl, sort of. She was super pale and had abnormally large eyes that were completely black. When the light hit her face, her head snapped forward and made eye contact with me and her jaw dropped open three times larger than any humans could. And then she screamed. And it was loud. Like inhuman loud. It sounded like a girl's scream but as if it were being played through a massive speaker to make it ear splitting. Then I felt something closing around my neck. She hadn't moved, but was somehow choking me, still screaming. I've realized while living out here that the entities can hurt you, but can also get hurt themselves. Now, most of them are tough as nails, but they can be hurt. This memory went through my head just as I felt something warm dripping onto my neck and my left ear went quiet. Busted eardrum. I aggressively threw my flashlight at the bitch and it connected with what I assumed was her eye. I couldn't tell for sure because I didn't have a flashlight. And yeah, I forgot to use the gun. It was new and in this current life or this situation, I forgot I had it. Luckily, this girl wasn't one of the tough ones and I felt the grip of my neck loose and her scream stopped. No sooner had I taken my first breath when she bent over backwards possession style and sprinted into the woods in reverse. When I finally caught my breath, I slowly walked by to my campsite and went to sleep in the tent. Now, you may be asking why I didn't go back home after that, but it was a 20-minute hike and my flashlight was broken so I had to wait till morning. Slept pretty good though. No noises woke me up. I then woke up the next morning expecting my ear to be killing me, but miraculously, it was completely back to normal. I later figured out that it was the lady in the tree who fixed my ear, but that's a story for another time. That morning I just packed up everything and headed back home. One thing that got messed up was my flashlight, so I wasn't even that disappointed in the trip. The only thing that got messed up was my flashlight, so I didn't even really care. I still don't camp out there anymore because no matter how weirdly wired I am, that girl really did freak me out a good bit, and I'm sure she's still out there. What you'll notice so far is that these entities aren't really effective killers, but that doesn't go for everything out here. I can't tell you all about the property without mentioning Skinny. Ugh, screw Skinny. 
I understand that skinwalkers are a common topic on the horror scene at the moment. And from what I can tell, I think that's the creature I'm dealing with. But I could also be wrong. Because if this is a skinwalker, it's advanced to another level. Not only does it imitate voice, it imitates appearance. And it really wants me dead or gone. I like to call it skinny. I think it pisses him off, though. And when I say his name, I say it loud. Because especially at night, I know he's listening. I've lived here for about three years now, and he's been harassing me for about a year. And he's good. One of the smartest things to come after me so far. The only one that can seem to almost get in my head. He tries to lure me out not by pretending to be someone in trouble like the other imitators that I've dealt with before. He's aware that that stuff doesn't work on me now. No, he tries to piss me off. He wants me to try to kill him. The problem is, we both know, I probably can't. One time he got me though. I was watching a documentary about veteran suicide. It's a terrible topic and I'm a supporter of our armed forces. And I think it's terrible that our government doesn't take better care of the vets that risk everything overseas so we don't have to. They were doing a slideshow of men who had unfortunately lost the struggle with their own demons. I had to look away for a second, because this one guy that appeared on the screen looked too young and happy to have gone to this dark of a place. He was mixed from what I could tell, athletic looking, and had a big dimpled smile on his face. When I look away... I'm suddenly staring at the same kid, outside my window. The same smile, same build, same uniform. One difference. Across his forehead was the word. Failure. I instantly knew it was skinny. He wasn't trying to imitate this kid. He was insulting him, and he finally struck a nerve. I had seen him imitate so many other people and try so many other tactics... But this was the one that finally broke me. I was going to end this creature. I exploded out of my chair and bolted from my bedroom, grabbed my 45 caliber handgun again, and proceeded to walk towards the same window where the young soldier was still staring through. I got within five feet and saw that the word had changed. It now spelled out, I deserved it. And after reading this, I didn't hesitate to raise my gun and fire two shots but I think he ducked him. Bastards fast. I stormed outside to try to find him, but he wasn't anywhere I could see. That's when I heard, Gotcha, whispered into my ear, and it was flung against the wall of my home. The gun flew out of my hand in the process, broke two ribs and dislocated my right shoulder. I was a dead man, and he knew it, but he let me go. Ever since the incident that led me to buy a house by myself out in the middle of the woods, I don't think I've ever felt fear again. Something's wrong with my head, but I did feel defeat. I fell for his trap and now he's going to kill me. As these thoughts passed through my brain, I passed out from the pain. Then, for some reason that I still don't understand, I woke up. It was bright outside and I was covered in blood and in more pain than I'd ever been in my entire life. But I was alive. But how and why was I alive? I struggled to stand up with my right arm hanging loosely at my side, and I noticed the words carved into the outside wall of my house. Next time. Screw skinny. Ever since I got back from the hospital, I told the doctors I fell off a roof, I've been trying to find ways to deal with or kill a skinwalker, if there even is a way, or if he's even a skinwalker. He beat me. I'm usually pretty lighthearted with most of my experiences, no matter how intense they are. But I just can't with this one, because if I lose to Skinny again, I guess I'll be signing off for good. Be careful out there, and don't be fooled like me. There isn't always a next time. But hey, not dead yet, so maybe there will be a next time. I plan on writing down more of my experiences in the future, so keep your eyes peeled and those ears listening. Until next time, Cole, signing off. I'm happy to see that my experiences have garnered some attention. 
wasn't expecting this stuff to actually get any traction. I'm mainly here to vent and have a place to catalog the stuff that happens around my home. And people also seemed to enjoy the part where the naked dude attacked me, then cartwheeled into the woods crying like a baby when I stabbed him. I'm still not sure if he was human. Now, I feel obliged to tell you more of my experiences. Also, please feel free to leave any questions you have, and I'll try to answer them in the next post. That being said, if you haven't listened to part one, I suggest you go back now and listen. I'm going to tell the following experiences, as if you already know about the other ones. This place isn't normal after all, and it takes some getting used to. Alright, alright. Now that the intro is out of the way, I think we can start with camo. And camo is a fucking nuisance. The first time I came into contact with him was during the first white-tailed deer season I had on my property. I'm a hunter, but the program that is helping me after the incident, said I wasn't allowed to have guns because the noise draws too much attention. Bullshit. I live in the middle of nowhere, and there isn't anybody else for miles, unless you count the Chosen, but I'm pretty sure that the program is worried about them. Luckily, the lady in the tree hooked me up with a 45 caliber I now have in my possession, but I didn't have it upon first meeting Camo, unfortunately. Alright, all right, back to the story. I first saw him when I was walking towards a ladder stand I'd set up on a tree to watch a deer, since I could no longer kill him. And yeah, I could have had a bow, but I'm shit with a bow and I'd risk hurting the animal. I don't like the idea of an animal suffering. I don't like the idea of an animal suffering, because I couldn't make a shot that would kill it instantly. Now, as I approached my stand, I noticed a figure already sitting in it. It's about the size of a regular human. He was dressed in full camouflage, pants, jacket, boots, hat, face mask, and backpack. He actually seemed like a regular person, and I hadn't seen any of those in the woods for the entirety of the four months I've been living there. The things that live on this property are generally more extreme, but no matter how relieved I was to see a proper human face for once, he was deep in my property and hunted in my stand. I had to get him to leave. I reluctantly shouted over to him, Hey, you ain't supposed to be here. Time to go, dude. Now, I was about 75 yards away and to his left, but I yelled plenty loud for him to hear me clearly. He didn't flinch. He stayed facing straight forward like a statue. What a prick. Look, try to be creepy all you want, but ignoring someone else like that is just rude. I know he hears me. I have reason to believe he was just trying to freak me out because I've made him break character before. So after I yell and he ignores me, I start getting impatient. I yelled the same thing at him again a little louder and still ended up with the same response. What a dick! Now I'm livid because he's making me ruin all my chances of seeing deer this afternoon by making me yell at him. So naturally, I start a brisk stroll over to tell him off to his face or maybe even kick his ass. I already noticed he didn't have a rifle, and so I just assumed that he was watching deer like I was planning on doing. Of course, he could have had a concealed handgun, but I'm a dumbass, so I didn't consider that. And then I heard the crunch of something under my foot, and then the sudden sound of ropes sliding across the surface at high speed. I froze for a fraction of a second and before I could squeak out and, oh shit, I'm hanging upside down from my ankle. There was a loop around my leg that held me suspended seven feet off the ground like a damn cartoon. I was like a freaking Looney Tunes character. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. I immediately knew it was camo, and when I look up, or down, shit, I was upside down so I don't really know where I had to look, but I saw him slowly climbing down the ladder. Like, really slowly. What a dramatic guy. If he wasn't so obsessed with appearances, he probably could have killed me. That's what I think he wanted to do anyways. There was a machete on his hip that I could now see, and the blade was chipped out in a way that made it look serrated. Wouldn't have been a very useful tool unless you wanted to use it to inflict pain. I think the biggest flaw with Camo's trap, though was that he didn't account for the single fact that 99% of people who live alone in the woods learn that carrying a large knife at all times is a necessary thing if you want to stay alive. 
I wish I could tell you I did a flip after I cut myself down and landed on my feet like some sort of badass. But I didn't. I landed on the back of my neck, and my vision went dark for about 15 seconds. Which I guess was enough time for Tweedle Dumbass to finally get to the bottom of my ladder stand. As I stood up, I saw that he was standing completely still at the base of the stand, still 50 yards away from me. Staring at me, I could hear his thoughts from here. Damn, why did he get out? Shit, shit, shit. Then he turned and bolted. This dude was booking. I lost sight of him in less than 30 seconds into my chase and had to give up. I gotta jog some more. And after all that, it started to get dark, and I didn't even get to watch any deer. I've seen Camo on multiple other occasions as well, but I figured him out. He got me the first time, but his traps really aren't that sneaky. They're elaborate, but not sneaky. He always appears in an area that I plan on hunting in, and I don't know how he knows where I'm going, but I stopped questioning stuff on this land a long time ago, and I always notice him long before I get to the location. Again, I have no idea how he plans this shit out. And secondly, there's always a trap set somewhere directly between when I first spot him and his actual location. Like, if I were to draw a line from him to where I see him from, the trap will always be on that line. Also, another important thing to realize is that none of his traps are fatal. They're all meant to keep me from escaping, but not kill me. Shit, they do hurt though. One time I almost stepped in a bear trap he had set out, and it for sure would have broken my leg had it got me. This non-fatal part was his downfall. I figured out that he didn't want me to die in a trap, he probably wanted to do the deed himself. Or maybe do something else, but he didn't really want me dead in a trap. So all I had to do to get him riled up was die in a trap, right? After the lady in the tree hooked me up with the pistol a little over a year and a half ago, one of the first problems I wanted to solve with it was the creator of the various nets, ankle snares, and holes that attempted to contain me many times before. And I knew exactly how I was going to do it. One of Camo's recurring traps was just a large... 11 foot deep hole covered by a large amount of suspiciously patterned sticks and leaves that could literally be seen a hundred yards away. I just had to wait until he used this trap again. After swinging a log that I think was supposed to knock me out, and another net that was meant to land on top of me, I might add that it was made of wire so I couldn't cut through it, but it also had a glare from the sunlight that made it impossible not to see, I finally came across the trap I was looking for. Four weeks after I got the gun, I find myself walking towards an 11 foot hole and trying to pretend I don't see it. And suddenly, I start falling. I was ready for the fall and let out a loud yell as I traveled downwards. And as I hit the ground, I stayed as quiet as possible, which was hard considering the broken toe and dislocated knee I had just received. Screw Camo for making me do this. My army crawled over to the side of the hole and laid my head against the side to make it look like I had broken my neck. And then I waited. It took 15 minutes for that little prick to dramatically make his way over to me, but I heard him walk up to the edge of the hole. I obviously had to close my eyes to appear dead because I couldn't run the risk of blinking, but I almost smiled when I heard Camo mutter to himself. Ah, oh, shit. No, 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 no. Oh, they're gonna be so pissed. I took advantage of the moment and quickly opened my eyes and whipped out the pistol, firing three shots at him as quickly as I could. I missed with all but one, and the bullet that met its mark put a hole in Camo's shoulder, and he let out a garbled scream of nonsense and gibberish. Something along the lines of, Oh, you piece of shit. Oh, I can't believe that ass. Ah. He did end up running away, but as he ran, I heard him say, Fuck this dude. I'm, oh shit, I'm fucking done. I was laughing my ass off until I realized I was severely injured and had to climb out of this damn hole. Good thing it was daytime, though or I might not have noticed the black rope that Camo had lowered into the hole while he was cursing himself for killing me. I somehow managed to pop my knee back in joint based on shit I had seen earlier in life, 
and climbed out to limp my way back to my home. That was a good day. Broken toes are expensive to get treated, though. The best part is that I haven't seen camo since that day. It actually worked. I wish I could pull something off like that with Skinny. Another thing I guess I need to explain to all you readers is the lady in the tree. I've mentioned her a few times now, and at least some of you are probably wondering about her. I honestly don't know much about her myself, but she is hands down the best thing on this property. My first experience with her was when she healed a broken eardrum that I suffered when meeting what I think was a banshee down in my creek. I was busted when she screeched really loud, and when I went to sleep, I woke up perfectly fine the next morning. I almost thought it was all a dream until I saw the blood still on my pillow and the broken flashlight that I had used in my personal defense. Well, I guess this was the first time she affected me directly, but not the first time she had helped me out. The true first time I didn't realize was until her last night. It was the gun. The gun I talked about purchasing in part one wasn't really purchased. I just wasn't willing to admit that I looted it off an old corpse that I'd found in an abandoned log cabin back in the property. This is an example of how sneaky she is. I only started to wonder if it was her doing while I was recording the first set of these stories and I started thinking about how good of a shape this gun was in. Of course, it was a little dirty when I found it, but it was in almost perfect operating condition and I figured that the skeleton that was clutching it didn't really need it anymore. But hell, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if he came to life each night. Either way, I left the cabin with a new sidearm and two boxes of ammo. I really didn't think about it too much because finding a gun on a body is pretty mild considering the events that go down here on a week-to-week -week basis. But yesterday, I started questioning the real origins of this gun. It was so well-maintained and feeling new when I got it, but the skeleton looked like it had been there forever. Not to mention the fact that the gun was loaded and the boxes of ammo were unopened, but the skeleton looked like it had died holding the gun like he was intending to use it. It didn't add up, so I headed back to the cabin and I found my answer. Everything was the same when I got there as it had been over a year ago. I mean, nothing had changed, especially not the body, the exact same as before. I was nervous at first, not because the body scared me, but because the joke about the skeleton coming back to life from earlier wasn't really that far-fetched in this place. I've never seen an undead skeleton, but I have seen other forms of undead. Maybe I'll tell y'all about those experiences sometime. Nervous or not, though, I had to confirm my suspicions. I approached the body and started examining the clothes. Just like I expected, the flannel shirt and brown jeans had no tags. Not like they had been ripped out, but like they were never there to begin with. Now there was only one thing left to check. I took out my knife and scraped the blade down the skeleton's exposed arm bone. And sure enough, a shaving fell off. It was wood. The entire skeleton was made of wood and painted a lightest brown among other discolorations to look like the real deal. The lady in the tree was very talented when it comes to wood, but she can do so much more. I've only seen her in person two times. Once when I caught a glimpse of her smiling as she walked into an opening into a tree, only to close the opening with a door that fit so perfectly, I couldn't see the edges when I walked up to it. It just looked like a normal tree. And a second time, two days after I encountered the screeching banshee in the creek. I saw her outside the window of my front door, smiling in. She winked at me and ducked out of view. I ran to the door to try to see her fully, but by the time I swung the door open, she was gone in the night, nowhere to be seen, which is really annoying. I would almost consider us friends by now, and she still won't show herself to me fully. Now when I saw her for the second time, I didn't know what or who she was. But when I looked at the ground in defeat, I noticed the small sheet of what looked like homemade paper. On it was a short message that read, I wish to congratulate you on killing Keelut. He was bringing an evil over the land that was distressing the forest. I don't know how you actually ended him, but I am happy all the same. I've seen you, Roman, and I'm certain that you have seen me. We work towards the same goal, cleansing this land. My vows as a medicine woman 
keeping me from directly interfering with the creatures of this land, but I wish you luck on your mission and will support you from the shadows as best I can. I hope your ear feels better. So I think the key loot she was talking to me about killing was a rabid coyote I killed a few days before the creek incident. It was hairless and just stared at me through some trees. I think it was trying to intimidate me to leave its territory, so I shot it between the eyes and left. My territory, bitch. But this was the first time I realized that I fully had someone on my side on this land and that was a relief. She was actually really helpful. Once I got bit by a rattlesnake and when I got home, there was a bottle labeled anti-venom sitting on my kitchen table. Another time I got bit by one of the shadow children while I was hiking, and when I got home, there was a bottle of purple liquid in a glass vial in the same place on the table. I honestly expected it to heal the wound or something, but it just made me really drunk. I guess she couldn't help me much that time. She's done other stuff too, but now I'm kind of worried about her. I haven't heard or experienced any help from her in eight months. I'm worried that something got to her. Or even worse, what if she's mad at me? I mean, Skinny almost killed me six months ago and she didn't do shit. I've grown to like her and even depend on her a bit. But she's just... gone. I think I'll call it quits for this post, but hopefully I can stay live long enough to post more. The hunt for Skinny continues. And if you don't know who that is, shame on you for not listening to the first post. And if you do know who that is, I appreciate any suggestions you have for killing them. See y'all next time. Cole, signing off. Hey guys, I'm back. I know it's been a few days since my last post. One of the pails chewed through the wires of my generator, and since civilians aren't allowed out of here by the organization, I had to wait three days for one of their electricians to get out here. The only reason I knew it was a pail that chewed through the main cable was because I watched it do it. I was hoping it would electrocute itself, but I forgot the part where that's the only source of power from my house since the Chosen have stolen my backup. This is probably a good time to say, if you haven't listened to the first two installments of this series, you should, because I highly doubt any of this will make any sense. They aren't long, and I'll link them at the bottom of this post. Now, back to the regularly scheduled programming. I realized while I was stuck in the dark for the past three days reading books, I could not appear boredom, that I hadn't told y'all about the pails yet. They suck, but they are kind of funny once you figure them out. I've seen them on quite a few occasions on the property. The pails are white humanoids that crawl on the ground on all fours, usually dragging their belly and using the same motion that Spider-Man uses to climb a wall. They can move at about a jogging pace, and their faces are usually stuck in distorted expressions of pain or anger. And boy, are they stupid as all hell. Let me tell you about the first one I saw. I had already been living here for about seven months, I think, so I was becoming familiar with the weird shit that calls this place home. I was out hiking some of my trails, and kinda halfway looking for weird shit, halfway minding my own business, and I suddenly can hear what sounds like a baseball player sliding through the leaves of the forest trying to reach home plate ahead of me. Only the sliding didn't stop, and it was coming straight towards me. I prepare myself by taking out my trusty Bear grill survival knife and entering what I would describe as an aggressive stance. I felt pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie. Expecting some creature to come barreling out of the bushes in front of me, I was a little shocked to see a butt-naked man with super pale skin drag itself out from under the brush on its stomach. What is with fucking naked dudes on my land? Can't I get a pretty woman at least once? Anyways, after I got done being flabbergasted and became aware of my surroundings again, I noticed that the dude was almost on me and was reaching out for my leg. So I jumped on his back, and it worked like a fucking charm. This little bastard didn't have superhuman strength like some of the other things out here, so when I laid it on its back, it couldn't do anything but sit there and flop its legs and arms around like a fish. At this point, I'm on the verge of tears. 
It hears me laughing and tries to turn its head to spit on me, which it can't do, and that made me actually start crying laughing. I fell off of it at this point, and the creature quickly turned around and locked its teeth onto the toe of my left boot. I like to wear steel toe boots around the property because even though they're heavy, I know that in a scuffle, and being able to kick with the boot and not having to worry about breaking a toe is a nice little advantage. This is what leads me to realize that even though the creature didn't have super strength, it did have a super bite. And when it first latched onto my boot, I wasn't worried and started trying to shake the thing off without much urgency. I already knew it wasn't a man by this point because it didn't possess an asshole or other genitals. But I got a little worried when I noticed the end of my boot changing shapes as the steel in the end started to bend. I then said out loud, if you don't stop right now, I'm going to stab your head, you little shit. It paused, as if debating on the decision, and then slowly started biting down again, while its eyes looked up at me, as if to try and call my bluff. I wasn't bluffing. A few seconds later, the thing is frantically clawing its way back into the forest with my favorite damn knife still in the back of its stupid fucking head. Nobody likes a thief. Got back home fine but I had to replace my favorite knife and get a new pair of boots, so it was a pretty shitty hike. It was the next time I saw one when I figured out their biggest fear. And it's so stupid. I was down in my creek playing with a new toy I had gotten in town earlier that week. It was this net that was designed to catch little minnows, and shit, it was a blast. I don't really have any use for minnows or whatever other little fish I was catching because I can't go to the only pond in the property that had a big fish in it since I made a deal with the crocodile man, so I was just catching them and letting them go. I'm suddenly greeted by the somewhat familiar sound of a grown man sliding across the ground on their belly. It had been almost two months since that last incident I had with the pail, but I immediately recognized the sound. This was the dunce that had stolen my knife, and I really value that Bear Grylls survival knife that can be purchased at your local Walmart. It really is a good product. Unfortunately, the pail that emerged this time wasn't the same one. It had a different face and was more of a light pink than original white than was on the first pail. It was still the same type of creature though, and this time, things went down different. As it tore into the clearing that I was in about 30 feet from me it froze with its eyes wide. As it tore through the brush, I was already facing its direction, holding the net spread out to my side the same way as a bullfighter holds a red cape. The pale's eyes were switching between looking at the net and looking at me, so I looked at the net and back to him. Then it clicked. No way! I giggled to myself as I started to catch on to what was happening. I took advantage of my suspicions and started running and flailing the net around at the pale and it freaked the hell out. It actually rolled over trying to turn too fast as it spun around and took off into the woods. I then started wheezing, laughing as I fell to the ground with tears running down my face. This thing can bite through steel, but it's terrified of a nylon net. I know that might not be funny to some because I may have a twisted sense of humor, but it made me weak. Long story short, I keep the little net in my hiking bag every time I go out now, and every pail I've come across is utterly mind-fucked at the sight of it. Good times, man. Wish all the things around here were that easy to deal with. On another note, I got an email from an organization asking me about the key loot that the lady in the tree claimed that I had killed in the last post. They wanted to know if I had disposed of the body, and if they could come and retrieve the remains from the woods if I had just left it. Then they said something that caught me off guard. When I said something about having to check with the program that put me out here, they responded with, We are the parent organization of that program, and proceeded to give me my own address, as well as details about my former life that only the program should have known about. In all seriousness, I have a dark past and haven't always been a great man, but I'm done with that shit, and it pissed me off that they would even bring it up. I responded with a simple, fine, but don't bring that shit up again, and blocked the emailer. 
No one's shown up yet, but I guess we'll see what happens. On a good note, I haven't seen Skinny in a couple of weeks, so that's nice. See y'all next time, and feel free to leave your questions in the comments. And if you have any ideas what these pails actually are, or what a key loot is, please tell me. If any of you are good with research stuff, I'd appreciate it. Talk to y'all again soon. Cole, signing off. Well, I'm back, guys. Welcome to part four of this... Documentary? Catalog? Um... Diary? I honestly don't know what this is anymore, because I thought I would only be using this platform to tell the stories of the stuff that has happened in the past on this property. But now I'm being forced to bring this... Journal? To the present? You see, those people from the organization did come to see about the key loot. And now there's this guy named Mark living in my house and sleeping on my couch. Well, not really sleeping, more unconscious. But we'll get to that part later. After a few days of this organization that wouldn't tell me their name, not showing up, I figured it was just a troll who managed to figure out my email account and hack into my personal info. But alas, on the third day, he rose. Nah, not really. But four guys did end up knocking on my front door. They were all dressed pretty normally except for the matching gray combat boots that told me that these men were men of action. Which also means that they're going to try their hardest to push me around and play badass. My suspicions were confirmed when the guy in the lead identified himself as Mark and immediately asked me where I claimed to have actually killed a key loot. What a prick. Look, I still don't know what the fuck a key loot is, and I don't claim to have killed one. The lady in the tree said I killed one. I only assume she's talking about the hairless coyote I killed down near the creek. At the mention of the lady in the tree, they all looked at each other with an expression of, this dude is a waste of time. The feeling was mutual. I was getting a little impatient by now, so I chimed in with a... If you guys are done being superior to me, I can take you to where I killed the coyote. The one behind Mark, whose name I don't remember, said, Sure, let's get this over with. Thirty minutes later, we're standing in front of where I killed the thing that I now know wasn't a coyote. Look, I know I may not have clarified it yet, but I killed this thing well over a year ago. Shit, maybe two years. And the only reason that the organization knew that I had killed it was because of the post I had made earlier this week. A lot of decomposing and feeding can happen to a body in the woods over that long of a time. On top of that, I hadn't been to this part of the property in a very long time because there aren't any trails or interesting locations here. But I was taken aback when I saw what had happened to the body over the course of the two years that had been here. Absolutely nothing. The body looked like I had shot it yesterday. The only evidence that it was older was that all the blood had seeped out of the head wound and had long since dried up. But the skin and face and the fur in his paws were completely preserved. It only had fur in his paws, which was odd. When we got to the body, the snickering crew of four went dead silent. Right, you said this was killed around two years ago, didn't you? That's Mark. Yeah, but I haven't been down here since. Why is the thing still preserved like that? What the hell is happening? One of the guys who hadn't said a word up until this point chimed in. And key loots are so unnatural and dark that nothing occurs in nature will have anything to do with an authentic one. This includes bacteria, fungi, and scavenger animals. Then he muttered something about a level 107 beast. Mark looked at me with a serious face and said, Right, so if this key loot story is true... Does that mean that all the shit you said in those posts about this place were true? Before I could answer with a, what do you think, asshole? A low, raspy laughter started to surround us and began closing in. It was coming from all directions. We looked up from the body to see at least 50 hooded figures surrounding us laughing menacingly. All four of the military men pulled their concealed pistols and took aim. But before they could fire a shot, I called out over the laughing. Hector, I told you the next time you and your little chosen crew sneak up on me, I'm kicking your asses again. Everyone paused. The chosen, the four organization men, 
and the pail that had just crested a hill 30 yards behind one of the cult members. And a few seconds later, one of the hooded figures took off his hood to reveal a chubby, jolly-looking face with rosy cheeks and wired rim prescription glasses. Aw, man, we didn't know they were with you, Cole. We thought they were trespassers. We're sorry, Hector said with a downcast gaze. Why do you even need them to begin with? I retorted. Hector hesitated for a moment and said, uh, Our god wants a real sacrifice and those white crawly humanoid thingies just aren't doing it for him anymore. At this moment, the pail that I could see frozen on top of the hill turned and bolted back into the woods. Hector then proceeded to call to the other hooded figures. Ah, uh, they're with Cole. We can't have them. There was a collective sigh as all the Chosen looked at the ground and walked away into the woods. I didn't notice until they were all gone that the four organization men hadn't lowered their weapons the entire time. All right, you pussies ready to head back to the house? It gets dark in 45 minutes and if those guys got you on edge, then you won't last long at night. Mark shot me a look that explained in detail how much he hated me, without the need for words while his three partners put on thick rubber gloves and put the key loot into a sort of body bag. As we're walking back towards my house with the three stooges carrying the corpse of the dog demon, Mark starts questioning me. What was that group back there? Some cult, I guess. They told me they worship Cult Hulu or something. He seems kind of taken aback for a second and then asked, Why do they seem wary of you, but not flinch when we had guns trained on them? Simple, they don't fear death but they do crack when exposed to severe pain for long enough. Again, Mark seemed surprised by my answer. He's starting to strike me as simple-minded. Right, so how did you inflict this pain on him? I don't want to answer any more of these questions. I really didn't. This was the kind of shit that I don't like to dwell on. That was a different life, and I don't like when it seeps back into the present. Sure, it's nice to have the local murder cult leave you alone, but I use methods that I regret to get that luxury. The last thing Mark said to me in our hike back to the woods was, Look, dude, my mind is telling me you are batshit crazy, but my instincts are telling me that you're a threat. Which one are you? I looked him dead in the eyes and mumbled, That's up to you. And let me tell you, the look on his face was priceless. I love buying games. A few minutes later, we reached the house and all four of the goons walked up to the big, black van they had arrived in. They start loading up the body and as I reach my doorknob to go inside, I hear Mark start raising his voice while talking on his phone. What? This guy isn't even right on the head. Uh, I know there's stuff here, okay, but why with... Look, let me get a team to... Okay, yeah. Yeah, he does have experience, but... Wait, what did you just say? He then stares at me with a mixture of confusion and disbelief. They told him where I came from. I could tell by the way he looked at me. He hung up the phone without arguing anymore and began to walk over to me. As he reaches me, he says, All right, my higher-ups have told me that I need to stay with you for a while and keep an eye on the activity around here. I responded with, You can't be serious. Hey, mate, I wish I wasn't, he said back, then added. They also want me to remind you that you didn't pay for this house or this property. With that, I opened the door with my best butler impression and gestured for him to enter my home. As he walked through the door and dropped what I assumed to be his emergency bug out bag on the floor, he froze. Can I just say one thing real quick? Fuck skinny. I didn't hear how heavily he was breathing at first, because the van was making noise as it was driving away, but as those sounds faded, I noticed that Mark was breathing like he had just sprinted a marathon. His eyes were turned on the window with his body completely rigid, with his hand on his hip ready to draw his gun. I followed his gaze to the window where I had confronted Skinny many times before, and sure enough, there he was only this time he wasn't someone I recognized. This time he was a fairly attractive, tall, and athletically blonde woman. She was smiling and holding a heart-shaped balloon. Upon closer inspection, 
I could tell that the balloon read, It's a girl. I rushed in front of Mark to try to snap him out of whatever trance he was in, but I soon saw there were tears welling up in his eyes. By this I gathered that this woman was no longer with us, and the girl most likely wasn't either. Fuck you, Skinny. I calmly started explaining what Skinny was to Mark, but soon after I started, he stopped me. Well, I've read the stories, Cole. I know that you've talked about this thing before, but I'm trained to handle these kinds of things, so don't worry about me, because I'm gonna fucking kill it. With that, he made a mad dash to the back door in an effort to get outside and confront Skinny. I managed to block him and push him to the ground, saying that he won't come inside, so just keep your shit together and we live. Mark wasn't in a listening mood, though. He jumped back to his feet straight into a fighting stance. Ugh, great. After a second, he threw a fast left hook straight from my face, but he wasn't fast enough. I ducked under the swing and connected my elbow to the underside of his chin. He went out like a light, and by the time the scuffle was over, Skinny was gone. I put Mark on the couch, and now I'm typing this out, thinking about going through his computer before he wakes up. But anyways, that's it for today. Please, if anyone knows what a key loot is, let me know. What did I kill? And what did Mark mean by he was trained to deal with this kind of stuff? What is he, a monster hunter or something? I'll try to get some answers before my next post. See y'all soon. Cole, signing off. I usually try to do some kind of intro to these posts, but today, I'm too excited to take the time to do that. If you haven't listened to my previous postings, you should though. They are quite a bit more action-packed and explain all the events that lead to where I am now. If you haven't listened to them, you won't have any idea what I'm talking about. Do y'all remember that last post when I joked about Mark being some kind of monster hunter or something? Well, I went through his computer, and I'll be damned if he isn't. He's got files on files and even more files about all these different tangibles, which I think just means monsters. I even managed to find a file on the key loop. No wonder they didn't believe I killed one. Apparently, a key loot is a creature in Native American mythology that's described as a furless dog-like thing. It does have fur on its paws, though, which supposedly makes it impossible to hear or track in the wild. Pretty tame so far, right? Don't worry, it gets better. Apparently, looking at them is supposed to immediately fry your brain and disorient you, making you an easy kill for the thing. But that didn't happen to me. The only reason I can think of for the mind cooker effect not happening to me is because I don't process things the same anymore. Not after the events that led me to live out here. Or maybe it wasn't even a key loot. There were a few more details I didn't get to read because before I could finish, I felt cold steel on my neck. Mark had woken up and was now pressing a knife to my throat. What do you think you're doing with my computer? The fuck does it look like? I'm trying to figure out who the man that was passed out on my couch is. Mark thought for a second, still not moving the knife from my neck. Then he asked, Why? No, how did you knock me out? I know you have a dodgy history, but close quarter combat fighting is my specialty. But all I can remember is going to hit you and then it went dark. Careful not to move and slit my throat, I said. You got desperate and went for a one-hit knockout. Frankly, your left hook is too slow to hit your opponent when you clearly telegraphed exactly what you were planning on doing with your hips. I dropped under the blow and threw an elbow to the bottom of your jaw. The knife loosened a little. You seem to know your stuff. Why pretend to be a dumbass then? Um, excuse me. First of all, I'm not pretending to be anything. Second of all, screw you. The knife fell away completely now. I took the opportunity to turn and start asking my own questions. So you're an actual monster hunter, huh? He paused for a moment before replying. Yeah, well, I guess I am. 
So, why is an organization that employs monster hunters also the owner of the organization that's helping me escape my past? Mark winced this time. Not a good sign. Eh, Cole, the organization that's claiming to help you escape your past probably doesn't exist. My organization has many false companies that it uses to gather intelligence and run experiments. I have reason to believe that they put you out here knowing about your past in an effort to see if anyone could survive in an area that's known for having extremely high levels of tangible activity. They also knew that if you were to die, they wouldn't have to worry about people looking for you. However, I also think that you have probably far surpassed their expectations. The higher-ups haven't actually told me so, but they can't possibly expect anyone to kill a key loot on their own or have fun with a creature like a flush gate. Holy shit, that was a lot to take in. I took a deep breath, then cautiously asked, What the hell is a flush gate? Mark put both of his hands on his head and let out a rawr. Seriously, dude, does anything even phase you? Flesh gates are those things that you call pails. They're only a level four, but still too much for most people to handle, let alone fuck with on a regular basis like you claim to do. There goes that level thing again. I'd seen various levels ranging from twos and threes, all the way up into the hundreds on the reports that I read while browsing Mark's computer but I still had no clue what they meant. What's all this level shit about? All the monsters on your computer have one, but I don't know what they mean. Mark shot me an angry look. I guess he was still mad that I had gone through his shit. Right, well, we base a beast's strength on how many unarmed adult men we predicted could take down before being overwhelmed. One man is equal to one level. Just then, I remembered the level beside the key loot was 107. So, so, hold up. You're telling me that the key loot I killed was rated at... Before I could finish, he interrupted me. 107. No way, I knew about the mind-baking stuff, but that thing was no larger than a golden retriever. No way in hell could it kill 107. Your people predict that the dog thing could kill 107 people? No, dumbass. They predict it could kill 106, then lose at the 107th. I had trouble believing them. Look, Mark, I read about how they can cook your brain when you look at them, but I stared at the thing in the eyes, and it had no effect on me at all. Why? This puzzled him. Well, I don't know, and that's why I didn't believe it when I first heard that some dude claimed to have shot a kilo to death on Reddit. What really confused me is why the higher-ups decided it was worth getting a team to go investigate. Now I know that they were fully aware of the caliber of the shit that happens here. Speaking of caliber, can I see the gun that you use on the key loot? Damn it, I knew this was going to happen as soon as I mentioned the gun in my posts. The organization had a no-gun rule for me, which is why it was a pretty big deal that the lady in the tree had helped me get my hands on one. But now they knew, and they weren't going to let me keep it. Ah, oh, fuck off, dude. I'm keeping the gun whether your bosses want me to or not. And to my surprise, Mark looked genuinely confused by my sudden response. <sighs> I don't want to take your fucking gun. I just want to see it. A normal pistol shouldn't be able to kill a killer with one shot no matter how perfect the aim is. I need to see what makes this gun different, and bring the bullets too. They're what I'm really interested in. He really didn't know about the rule I'd been given about no guns. Weird. I reluctantly went into my room and retrieved my trusty 45 caliber thunder stick and the only box of ammo I had left. I started off with two large boxes of bullets, but over time my supply was whittled down to just half a box. As soon as I dropped the weapon and ammo onto the coffee table, Mark immediately started inspecting one of my bullets. Well, I knew it. Did you even know what these are, Cole? Uh, 45 caliber? I responded somewhat slowly. Without looking up from the bullet, Mark began to explain. These are NAT rounds, specifically designed to deal with unholy creatures of chaos. 
They are created when the metals used to make the bullets are blessed by Native American shaman and medicine men. You can tell what they are by the slight warmth they give off and the small vibrations you can feel when you squeeze them between your fingers. However, these are the most active rounds I've ever come in contact with. They're much warmer and vibrate much more than the rounds that I'm issued. If the lady in that tree gave you these, she's likely more powerful than you realize. Mark looked up, maybe expecting some type of awe at this revelation. Well, that's neat, I responded. I guess it was cool to have enchanted bullets and all, but it didn't change much in the grand scheme of things. Kind of like how your car's speedometer goes up to 120 miles an hour. Most people won't ever drive that fast, but it's cool to know that when the time comes you might be able to. Then again, I guess the magic bullets came in handy when I shot the key loot, as well as a few other things, so maybe I should be more grateful. Before Mark could scold me again for my lack of reaction to his astounding observations, we were interrupted by a knocking on the door. We looked over to see one of the three guys Mark had been working with when he first arrived. Through the window in my door, we could see him frantically beating on the wood and looking over his shoulder. Mark, Mark, it, it, it attacked the van. Holy shit, Jack is dead and Phillips is hurt bad. Come help me carry him, please. Mark started to jump up and then caught himself. Oh, cool, this thing is good. It almost got me a second time. Shit. And it almost got me with the fucking help me technique as well. I started to smile. At least Mark wasn't a complete dumbass. I watched Skinny as he began that stupid grin he always did when he got figured out. Then he darted off. Not much has happened over the past few days, and I'm starting to get used to my new roommate. I'll still keep you all posted, though. Something wild is bound to happen sooner or later, especially with the patrols Mark keeps making us go on. Cole signing off. For now. Well, last post I said something wild was bound to happen sooner or later, and I wasn't disappointed. Mark's been living here for about a week now, and he finally got what he was looking for. Action. It wasn't really in his favor, though. I mentioned the patrols he keeps taking me on last post, and I didn't really want to go into detail. He calls them patrols, but it's honestly more of a scavenger hunt. He even gave me a damn list. Like a little kid or something. On the list were specific signs and objects that are indicative of tangible activity. Intangible is fancy talk for monsters. I asked him what an intangible was as a joke and he nonchalantly said, Ugh, ghost, another shit you can't touch. After I realized he was serious, I popped the question. Why not just say monsters and ghosts and shit? He thought for a moment. Hmm, because the people who name this stuff are Neds. Fair enough, I guess. I'm off on a tangent again. Back to the scavenger hunt. The list he gave me had a lot of stuff on it, and as I was walking through the woods for the second time that day, one thing on the list kept catching my eye. Stairs. Why the fuck would stairs even be on his list? That's not paranormal at all. Also... If there had been stairs in these woods, I would have already found them. That ain't something you miss. I mean, I, I thought this whole search around for stuff idea was stupid from the beginning anyways. I never searched for the hell spawn on this property. It always found me all by itself. The only reason I even participated in Mark's patrols were to humor him so he wouldn't be as crabby and because I like to get outside anyways. Even so, stairs... I was looking at the list, eyeing down the word stairs for the millionth time when it suddenly got dark. I'm confused. I looked up to see that it hasn't actually gotten dark. I was just in a shadow. A shadow that was being cast by a tall, skinny wooden wall. I had been to this exact spot a few days earlier, and there had been no such object. The wall was about five feet wide and ten feet tall and I somehow almost walked directly into it without realizing. I began to walk around it and quickly realized it wasn't a wall. Yep, 
you probably already guessed. It was the back of a fucking flight of stairs. I was honestly shook. It was like I had summoned them after thinking about them too much. I immediately called Mark on the radio he had given me for situations just like this and yell, Dude, I actually found stairs. Like, real friggin' stairs out here. I hadn't been this excited about something in a long time, and I had no idea why I was excited now. I think it had something to do with me thinking the stairs were such a stupid thing to look for, only to end up finding some when I never expected to. Either way, I barely heard Mark respond with, All right, all right, just stay put for a minute. I'll be there soon. And please stop screaming. You're scaring away all the... the things out here. He said something else, but I wasn't listening. I was far too engrossed in these stairs. I had to go up them. It wasn't like they were calling to me or anything. It was more the fact that I was pretty sure I'd be able to see my house from the top. So with Mark still saying unintelligible commands on the radio, I began to ascend. As I walked up the stairs, the woods around me started to quiet down, which is weird in retrospect, but I really didn't pay any attention to that. Another thing I noticed was that there wasn't any leaves or dirt or anything on the steps. And anyone who has experience in the woods knows that it only takes a few hours for Mother Nature to spread her shit all over any given object that's left in her care. The real anomaly happened when I hit the top step, though. You see, the second my heel hit the top step, I heard Mark let out a, What in the son of a bitch? I froze. I started weighing my options. If I let whatever was out there kill Mark, I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. I also told myself... I wasn't going to kill anyone anymore. Does it really count as killing him if I just let him die, though? <sighs> I'd probably just replace him anyways. I guess I'll go help. And with that thought, I went to go help him. I honestly expected there to be a pail clamped onto his foot or for him to have fallen into one of Camo's traps. But alas, all I found was Mark, without shoes on, just socks, and clenching the toes of each of his feet in his hands. And before I could even ask him what was going on, he stuttered. Hey, you went on the damn stairs, d d d didn't you? Yeah, and why does that matter? Well, I'm telling you, if looks could castrate. Bad shit happens when you go up the stairs, you dick. I told you over the radio not to go up them. I uh, must have missed that part. What happened to you anyways? Now, this part's kind of nasty. Mark let go of the end of one of his socks to reveal that the toe area was covered in blood. He then removed the shock, and I shit you not, all of his toenails were gone. Damn, how'd you manage that? Are you deaf, Cole? You did this when you went up those stairs. Yeah, sounds stupid, I know, but I kind of believe him, because I know for a fact that those stairs weren't normal. I'm certain of this, because when I went back to where they were to show Mark, who was limping something awful, they weren't there anymore. Just disappeared. Mark wasn't surprised by this either, and in case you were wondering, I could not see my house from the top, which was a bummer. That's about it for the stairs, but something else did happen yesterday, the day after the stair incident. I actually met a brand new monster, at least, new to me anyway. I think Mark knew what it was, but he won't tell me. It gives him the spooks. As you may have already gathered, it happened on one of Mark's patrols. He was actually adjusting to life without toenails pretty good, and I'll give him that. The night before, he took a large amount of bandages and some rubbing alcohol from my bathroom. I guess he did a good job on himself because he was walking pretty close to normal now. I did hear a lot of groaning and heavy breathing that night in my living room, though. I hope it was him patching himself up and not him having fun on his laptop, if you know what I'm saying. Anyways, we were walking through an area of the woods that stays somewhat dark during the day due to the dense tree cover blocking out most of the sun. Other than the lack of light, everything seemed pretty docile. 
That was until Mark started complaining about a noise. Cole, do you hear that, um? I think it's like static or something. What? Uh, no, I, I don't hear a thing. Mark put a hand on my chest and stopped me mid-sentence. I look over at him to see what's up and he's staring at me with extremely wide eyes. We need to get to that house now. I'd never seen him get this flustered so I knew things were serious. I nodded and we both turned to run to the house but the tall man was already blocking the way. Now, when I say tall man, I mean really tall man. I'm also fairly certain he wasn't even a man. Tall man just makes a good name. He was between 10 and 12 feet tall and was wearing clothes made of what looked like dirty brown and tan rags stitched together. These rags covered his whole body, including his hands, feet, and face. He was also thin, but something deep in my gut told me that he held some kind of unnatural strength. As his image sank into my brain, I heard Mark whisper, Holy shit, it's one of them. Off to my left, there was complete silence for a while, not actually sure how long. The only thing that I could hear was a slight static buzzing sound. No one moved in the silence, not Mark, not me, not the pail that was about to bite into Mark's legs while he was distracted. Wait, holy shit, Mark, look out, pail on your right. With surprising speed, Mark pulled out his Glock and put two shots in the pail's head. It didn't move after that, but the tall man did. The sudden scuffle seemed to set the tall bastard off into a rage, and the one subtle static sound grew into a roar. It was like no sound I'd ever heard before, maybe something like the sound of metal being ground up by other metal, but the sound was the least of our worries. It started sprinting at us. It was about 30 yards away, but it seemed to cover the distance in the blink of an eye. He was on us before we could react. He went for Mark first and reached out for him with one of those long, skinny arms. His fingers seemed to stretch out just so that they could reach all the way around Mark's torso. As Mark was lifted off the ground kicking and yelling, he emptied the rest of its clip into the tall man's head. It did nothing. That's about the time when the big black tentacles ruptured out from the creature's back six new weapons now ripping holes in the rags this thing must be terrible at making its own clothes like how hard would it be to just make tentacle holes so you don't end up ripping your shirts anyhow i really didn't want this big fellow ripping up mark so i had to figure something out before it managed to obliterate old marky i drew my gun and emptied my own clip into various parts of the monster in an effort to find a weak spot no luck in fact the bullets bounced off of him. One of them whizzed right by my ear. It was like under those rags he was made of steel. But I'm no quitter. I now had his attention and I'm pretty sure Mark was going unconscious at this point because he couldn't breathe due to the thing's death grip. I drew my brand new Bear grill survival knife and lunged with all my strength at his leg. If bullets couldn't get past this thing's skin, my knife didn't have a chance but I had a plan. I got behind it, only to get snatched into the air by one of its tentacles. I was immediately faced to... um... rags with this thing? Its tentacle was wrapped tightly around my stomach, and it now had Mark and I both exactly where it wanted. I swear I could hear deep, demonic laughter within the still roaring static that filled my brain. But it stopped laughing when I started. I began scream laughing, not really sure why, sometimes I think I might actually be insane. The tall man cocked his head to the right as if saying, you do know you lost, right? And the only thing I was able to say before the last of my air was squeezed out of me was, I really hope this fucking works. And with that, I took the knife that was still in my hand and sliced at the tentacle as hard as I could. My hope was that since the tentacle could move fluidly, the skin would have to be softer and weaker. Otherwise, it would be stiff and not flexible. Oh, how right that theory was. I was met with a spray of hot black liquid and the static sound morphing into the sound of nails on a chalkboard. 
I fell seven or eight feet to the ground and landed flat on my back. That shit hurt, but adrenaline is a hell of a chemical. So I was back on my feet almost immediately. Two things I noticed off the bat. It was still holding a now unconscious mark, and my attack hadn't quite managed to slice through the entire tentacle, but it was close. The thing seemed to be deciding on whether to retreat or try to kill me again. I took advantage of this slight hesitation and leapt at the now limp tentacle. I grabbed it and yanked with all the force I could muster, and now it completely severed itself from the beast. Suddenly all the sounds in my head stopped, and I heard Mark hit the ground off to my right. I looked up only to see the now tall man's covered head aimed at its now disconnected appendage, and then at me, and then at the woods behind him, and then at me, and then at his tentacle. Something tells me he's never been injured before. After he finished looking at stuff, he bolted backwards just as fast as he had approached us before. Yeah, he sprinted off backwards. What is it with monsters and running backwards? It seems silly to me and dangerous. Anyways, I ended up having to carry old Mark over my shoulder back to the house, and he could stand to lose a few pounds. He woke up a few hours later and interrogated me on how I had managed to scare the thing off after he passed out. I told him I just ripped off my clothes and started running at the thing until it ran off. Mark said he won't let me see the thing's file until I tell him what really happened, but I want to sell the naked story. Maybe I'll tell him what really happened later and let y'all know the real name of the thing. Or maybe I'll keep trying to convince Mark that while he's a monster hunter, I'm a monster predator. That's it for now though, guys. I'll post again soon. In case you were wondering, I haven't seen Skinny in a few days and still haven't heard from the lady in the tree for a while. But life goes on, right? Be sure to check out the other parts of this series. I'll have links down below. Until next time, Cole, signing off. So, Mark got possessed. It was a new experience for me, honestly. Also, I think we're going to have to deal with Skinny soon. He destroyed a van the other day that was carrying supplies out to us. I'll get to that later, though. I actually learned a lot from the spirit that possessed Mark before it left. And yeah, it left. I didn't have to banish it or anything. Let me just tell the story before I end up spoiling something. The day after the tall man incident, Mark started acting funny, but in a good way in my opinion. He was much less commanding and hostile, like he had no energy. This meant he didn't want to keep checking around the property for monsters constantly, and I was able to do what I wanted again without him complaining. When I noticed the change in his behavior, I thought of two reasons that could be causing Mark to act this way. One, he was sick. And two, he was being a scaredy little bitch after almost being killed by the tall man. And turns out, I was wrong on both accounts. After two days of Mark being reserved and borderline unresponsive on my couch, I knew something was up. As much as I don't want to admit it, Mark is a badass in his own right. He isn't the kind of person to crumble after a traumatic event. He's a fighter. I was aware of his unnaturally aggressive fight-over-flight response when he first encountered Skinny and almost rushed out to certain death just to show Skinny that he wasn't here to play games. On top of that, he didn't show any real signs of sickness. He was tired and slow to respond, yeah, but he wasn't sensitive to light like a concussion. He wasn't hot or cold, no runny nose, no trouble breathing, etc. It was on the third day of this strange behavior, yesterday, when I confronted him and got an answer. So, uh, Mark, any idea why you're so tired and lazy and shit? Just as I finished asking this, Mark shot up to his sitting position on the couch and whipped his head around to face me. In a voice much higher than his regular voice, he exclaimed, oh, I thought you'd never ask. I finally finished taking over this body a few hours ago and was waiting for the right moment to reveal myself. You see, Mark is on vacation right now 
and I'm taking his place. Uh, okay, nice. When will he be back? His wide smile quickly found itself upside down. You know what, Cole? This is why I really hate you. You are literally no fun whatsoever. Well, if you aren't Mark, then I don't know you. And how would you know that I'm not fun? Don't you know it's wrong to judge a book by its cover? Mark? No, the replacement Mark's voice was starting to sound irritated. I'm a ghost, dipshit. I've been here for months trying to mess with you. I even tried to possess you, but unfortunately, you and I are incompatible. And no matter how hard I tried to get your attention to scare you, I was always met with you just brushing it off. I worked really hard, too. Like that time I moved the TV you were watching. Or the time I put holes in all your socks to make your big toe pop out. I was finally starting to catch on to what was happening at this point. Oh, I thought the TV was just the... Holy shit. You're the one who put holes in my socks. You piece of cock meat. You made me think I had sandpaper toes. He chuckled a little. At least that one worked anyways. As you probably already knew, and being a ghost has its limits. It's extremely difficult to have any effect on the physical world, and we can't affect living tissue in any kind of direct way whatsoever. But now that I have a vessel, I can finally kill ya. Well, shit. That escalated quickly. As I processed the new information that I had just received, Fake Mark speaks up again. One thing I bet you didn't know is that as a ghost, when I take over a body, I can't see all of the host's memories, but the body retains any natural reflexes and skills that the host has acquired through his or her lifetime. And this guy has some seriously badass skills. The fake Mark sprang to his feet and did a roundhouse kick that shattered a nearby lamp into a million pieces, then turned to my wall and punched as hard as he could. I'm pretty sure he expected to punch right through, but only ended up leaving some kind of bloody knuckle prints. Yeah, there's a stud there, I said as fake Mark doubled over holding his damaged hand. I realize that now, thank you. He wheezed out before standing back up straight again. Even so, this guy is plenty skilled enough to end your sorry ass. Fake Mark said with a wicked grin. Mm, you must not have been here the first night he got here, but okay. He cocked his head a little after this comment, then quickly brushed it off and lunged at me. I'll try to explain what happened next as best I can. As he rushed me, he threw a right-handed jab at my head, and I countered this by hooking my arm over the inside of his shoulder with my left arm as I ducked the punch and put my right arm between his legs so I could lift him off of the ground. I then did a fireman throw, which basically means that I tossed him into the air and subsequently slammed him back onto the ground by exploding back up to a standing position and releasing my hold on his leg while still keeping a strong grip on his shoulder. This made fake Mark fly over my head and still slam onto the ground at my feet. I wanted to explain how this happened so people don't accuse me of bullshitting, and for the record, I don't think this would have worked on the real Mark. I'm sure he would have seen it coming. Anyways, this should have knocked the breath out of him, so I wasn't ready when he punched the back of my knee and dead-legged me so perfectly, I went straight to my ass. Middle school me would have taken notes on perfect execution of this move. Fake Mark ended up getting back to his feet before me, unfortunately, and jumped onto me and putting me flat onto my back. Fake Mark then reeled his fist back for a final blow. As his fist flew towards my face, I managed to move my head to the side at the last second, and his fist connected with the hard wood floor at a respectable speed. He may have been able to recover from this quickly if it hadn't been the same hand that he had already smashed on the wall a few moments before. As Fake Mark winced at the pain, I threw my leg into the air and proceeded to connect with his no-no square. It was more effective than the slam from earlier, that's for sure. I stood up slowly while Fake Mark tried to decide 
if he should use his remaining good hand to grab his crotch or his shattered knuckles. Before he could decide, though, I grabbed his Glock that was sitting on the coffee table and took aim. It didn't take fake Mark long to look up and realize that I now had complete control of the situation. He stood up, but didn't make any further advancement at me. He instead wanted to put on a pouty face and plop down onto my recliner in defeat. And then it hit me. Why are you afraid of dying? That isn't even your body. You can die again, right? The fake Mark snapped in a still somewhat aggressive tone. If this body dies while I'm in it, I'll get sent back. And I don't think I'll be able to escape again if that happens. Why are people always so vague when I ask a question? Escape from where? That's an important detail. I fully expected fake Mark to snap back again, but all he did was look me in the eyes and mumble, Hell. The absolute terror on his face seemed genuine, and usually I try to stay respectful and patient when someone is in an emotional state like that. Unfortunately for fake Mark, he wasn't a person, but he was a ghost that was possessing my... Uh acquaintance and i don't really appreciate that very much so i continue with my questioning how did you escape hell the first time the fake mark was surprisingly cooperative now i found a gateway and walked through it ended up on this land i think there's some sort of portal to hell around here it seems that it's mostly ancient creatures that come out though instead of regular spirits only thing i can figure is that they were all banished to hell, only to be let back out at this location. Damn, I was expecting a badass story about a battle with the devil, not an actual plausible cause for all the crazy shit that goes on here. Well, you seem to know your shit. Why do I get the idea that you know more about hell and monsters than the average lost soul? I was a preacher in life. Then why were you in hell? because I studied the occult in my spare time and skimmed out of the donation bowl. Ah, that makes sense. I guess God is cheeky like that. But what makes you think that all the weirdos in those woods come from a portal to hell? The fake Mark then started speaking in a more relaxed and confident manner. Not all the beasts out there come from the portal. Actually, most of them don't. Just some of the particularly nasty ones. You met one the other day. I think you called him the tall man. He's a recent immigrant. I think he got banished in the 70s by some kind of monster hunting group. He was one of the more average ones, but you already know the most powerful one, don't you? At this, the fake Mark started grinning. He was right. I knew exactly who he was talking about. It's that Chuck Hulu guy that the Chosen worship, isn't it? Fake Mark's grin transformed into a grimace. Holy hell, Cole. I seriously fucking despise you. It's that thing you call skinny. Cthulhu is a cosmic entity from another plane of existence, separate from hell. Skinny, on the other hand, is an absolutely perfect product of hell. So, he's a demon then? No, no, not a demon, but an amalgamation of at least a few other creatures that I'm pretty sure old Lucifer created himself. If I had to guess, Lucy is planning to take over the mortal plane and is throwing some creatures out here to test the waters before his final assault. Shit, that isn't good. I might be on his bad side since I keep mooning Skinny. And, and how do you... Do you do you know what Skinny is? No. But I do know that he doesn't seem to be able to enter a home without being invited in. And when he takes the appearance of something, whether it be a sumo wrestler or a baby rabbit, he maintains the same weight and strength as his regular form. And how do you know he stays the same weight? And because I once saw him spying on you as a squirrel, only to snap the giant branch he was perched on under his weight, and then proceed to shred the trunk of the tree with his little squirrel claws until it fell over out of frustration. I remembered that tree. 
I thought it had been attacked by the family of six-legged beavers that lived down the creek, but I guess I was wrong. It was beginning to seem like fake Mark was a serious asset when it came to knowing about the stuff around here. I'm also curious about what different monsters make up Skinny. If any of you have any ideas, feel free to comment them, because I'm pretty clueless as of now. The invitation thing is from vampires though, isn't it? I don't know, it sounds too cliche to be true. Anything else you want to get off your chest, preacher man? I guess I hit a nerve with that question. Fuck you, I'm a woman. I'm tired of you being so damn clueless. What? I didn't know that women preachers were a thing. Again, poor choice of words for me. That's it. I'm leaving. We were practically screaming at each other at this point, which in hindsight was really unnecessary. Oh, okay, to be fair, you don't look or sound like a girl in Mark's body. And all I ask is that you answer one more question. Fine, she yelled. I had been wondering about this since the beginning of the conversation, so I was ecstatic to get one more chance to ask. You said that I was incompatible for you to possess me. Why is that? At this, fake Mark took on a serious expression. It means that you're either a descendant of some saint or some godly power favors you. Or maybe... Ah, uh, no, it couldn't be that. And with that, fake Mark seemed to pass out. Guess it was the spirit leaving the body. Soon after, real Mark started to wake up and ask where he was. I told him it was a long story, but he should probably get some fresh air before I told him. When he grabbed my outstretched hand so I could help him up, I squeezed. While he yelled in pain, I calmly told him, You owe me a new lamp. That's all for Mark's possession. He actually took the news pretty well. I think he's been possessed before or something. I kept the part about me being incompatible to myself. Not really sure why. It just didn't seem like something I should share at the time. Things are heating up around here. Something big is going to happen soon. And with the information we got out of Spirit Preacher Lady, it's starting to look like me and Mark can't do this on our own. I think he called in backup, but he won't actually tell me for sure. He just keeps looking out the windows a lot. I'll update you again soon. Cole, signing off. Hey guys, I've got a good bit of explaining to do. I've lied to all of you on a few occasions now. Now, now, I haven't lied about any of the creatures, ghosts, or people, though, so don't worry about that. But I have lied about how I acquired some of my possessions. As you all should know by now, I didn't purchase my 45 caliber handgun. It was gifted to me somewhat indirectly by a good friend. What I haven't explicitly stated yet was that I didn't exactly buy my house or property either. Although I'm sure many of you probably figured that out though. What I'm getting at was that I was placed here. Three years ago, I was approached by an organization while I was hiding out at a bar in Mexico. I have no idea how they found me because even though I had been shit-faced for two solid weeks, I know for sure no one in that area even spoke English so I don't think I could have ratted myself out. The people I was hiding from are not paranormal in any way, and that's a story I'm not certain I want to share right now, but I may share later on. Anyways, this group approached me and made an offer. Again, I'd been shit-faced for two straight weeks, so my memory is spotty. From what I can remember, they said something about helping me escape the problems I had created with, um, that group. Normally, I would have immediately suspected that they were the enemy in disguise. But again, drunk-ass me thought that this is the greatest damn thing that could happen. I mean, they were offering me a place to stay with a limited amount of money allowance to purchase food and whatever else I needed. I just assumed it was government-funded. 
And then again, the government thinks I died 12 years ago, I think? None of that matters now, though. See, I pretty much figured out what really happened behind the scenes with some help from Mark. We've been sharing a hospital room for the last week, so we've got plenty of time to think. I'll get you up to speed on how we got here soon. I think this is going to be a long post. So, as much as Mark and I can figure, the organization that was offering me witness protection type services was actually a fake front that was run by the monster hunting group that Mark works for. Their goal was to find someone with above average survival skills and to see how long a human could last in an area with a high concentration of fucked up things roaming around. Let me emphasize that the assholes that planned this experiment probably didn't expect me to survive my first encounter, let alone live there for three years. Then when the key loot showed up, they got giddy. According to Mark, they've never been able to observe a dead key loot before the one that I killed. He sure knows how to make me feel special. And that's when Mark and his crew got sent out, and old Marky Mark has been with me ever since. I think that was four-ish weeks ago. But enough of the theory shit. Let me tell you about the clusterfuck that put me and Mark in the hospital. That ghost preacher bitch that possessed Mark a while back only got about a half of her facts right. I found this out when Mark and I decided to go out to the home base of the local cult that lives on the back of my property. They call themselves The Chosen. I don't know what they're chosen for, but I know for sure that no one in that ragtag group of dipshits shouldn't be chosen for anything but extermination. They've tried to sacrifice me three different times now. The last attempt went as far as attempting to try and burn down my house but I caught them in the act and convinced their leader, a short Latino man named Hector, not to bother me anymore. I really didn't want anything to do with them because they're so awkward. But Mark was certain that they probably have some information about why more deadly creatures seem to be popping up at a higher rate, or maybe at least have some knowledge about Skinny. I tried to convince him that I knew more than the Chosen when it came to Skinny, but he insisted that I was about as observant as Helen Keller, whoever the hell that is. So there we are, standing in front of their little shanty town that they call the Ponderosa. It's mostly made up of metal sheds and parts of mobile homes. Yeah, parts and people living inside with whole walls missing. Yeah, parts with people living inside with whole walls missing. Keep in mind that these people aren't poor. Almost all of the members have nice cars and trucks parked outside their homes. A new Chevy Silverado, nice Ford Mustang, and many others that I don't know the name of off the top of my head. I don't really understand what philosophy leads to them living happily in a shithole like this. But hey, to each their own, I guess. We found Hector pretty quickly. He was in the middle of all that squalor, preaching about something or other. He noticed me and Mark almost immediately due to the fact that neither of us were wearing dark robes like the rest of the cultists. Mark was wearing black combat pants and a great long sleeved t-shirt that made him look like he meant business. I, on the other hand, was wearing blue jeans and a Twizzler t-shirt. Hector stated somewhat solemnly, I guess we have guests now, and proceeded to step down off of his upside-down five-gallon bucket. As he approached, Mark whispered just loud enough for me to hear, They're surrounding us. And sure enough, he was right. I look around to see not only Hector approaching us, but about 60 different cold members approaching us from different directions. They were closing in and both Mark and I prepared to draw our weapons to defend ourselves when Hector called out, Children, calm down. Don't you see he's got a gun now? Let's please try not to get on his nerves. I could see Mark start smirking out of the corner of his eye, but I didn't have the heart to tell him that they weren't talking about him. Look, um, Hector, right? 
We were just wondering if you had any idea about where some of the paranormal creatures in this area are coming from. This question seemed to make Hector uncomfortable. We haven't been seeing anything like that around here, so... Just then, one of the black-robed cultists came bursting through the surrounding crowd. Grand Bishop Hector, the baby doll spider came back. At this revelation, Hector knew that we knew that he knew what we wanted to know. All he could do was look back and forth from his distraught follower and us, and he finally decided to just awkwardly smile at us. As much as Mark wanted to continue questioning, we both noticed that the cultist that came back was missing large chunks of his robes and his flesh. While the man stood there hyperventilated in front of his leader, Mark pointed something out to me. Cole, oh, he's got a severed hand, he whispered. We didn't want anyone to overhear us while all the focus was on Hector trying to console the hysterical man. I responded to Mark's observation with, Look, if this thing is coming, we may have to put this skinny hunt on hold. As much as these people are a nuisance, I really don't want to see a community get slaughtered. Mark shot a conflicted look at me. Right, I agree, but we aren't prepared for a fight with something like that. While we were talking, I felt a tap on my shoulder. It was Sonia, Hector's second in command. I hadn't seen her since the last time I was in their little neighborhood, and I hadn't really left on a good note. Now, she looked deadly serious. Cole, we have all the information you want, and some that you probably don't. But before I tell you, we need your help. This thing is going to tear us to shreds, but I have a way to get rid of it. Sonia was the only member of the Chosen that struck me as somewhat smart. I think she was raised into the cult, and that was the only reason why she hadn't left. In some twisted way, it's her only family. Before Mark could protest, I answered, We're in. So, what are we? I was interrupted before I could finish my sentence by a loud screeching. The sound was beyond unnatural. I could describe it as a young woman screaming in terror, but the tone kept changing instantly like a shitty auto-tune from hell. Mark and I looked at each other. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. I looked back to ask Sonia what she had planned on doing, but when I looked in her direction, she was already sprinting away. I really hoped that she was grabbing some sort of secret weapon and not just being a coward. I didn't have time to dwell on these thoughts, though. There's the beast, cresting the hill, Mark said as he jerked my attention back to the situation at hand. Sure enough, as I looked through the trees that led uphill, I could see a mass of tan, white, and dark red charging down the hill. As it got closer, the cultists started running around wildly. Some pulled out spears and knives, but that looked like they were trying to use chopsticks for the first time. They weren't going to be much help. I was starting to make out some of the details on the thing as it approached. The main defining feature of the baby doll spider was that it was in fact made of what looked like baby dolls. But not just dolls though. Mannequins, cosmetic practice heads, the whole nine. It seemed like all of the different objects were held together by some magic stickiness. I disagree with calling it a spider though. It had four legs and two arms. It was shaped more like a centaur. Another odd detail was that each body part was made up of that specific body part. Where the head should be, there was a mass of mannequin doll and other forms of heads that were just crammed together. The same rule follows for the legs, arms, torso, and so on. Mark, what the hell is that thing? Well, I don't know. Usually, if you see a doll or something moving around, it's a possession. But this is something else entirely. That lady you were talking to better have a good idea. The abomination was now closing in, and had reached on one of the outermost sheds that dotted the Chosen's headquarters and began tearing it to pieces. I don't think guns are going to work on this thing. I bet it doesn't even have internal organs that a bullet could damage. And I doubt that it would respond to Nat Round since it doesn't look Native American. We're going to need to use stuff that'll break it. I said as Mark grabbed a spear from a nearby occultist and slung it at least 40 yards to hit the thing in the torso. What the fuck? Mark can throw spears too? 
Even though it was a solid hit, the monster didn't reel back at all. It just looked in our direction and let out another screech before charging us at full tilt. It was at this point that I realized that the beast was not colored red anywhere on its body. All of the deep red I had seen was just blood that was kicked onto the baby doll centaur. Damn it! Doll spider does sound better. As it got closer, Mark yelled, Get his attention, or I've got an idea. I nodded and pulled out my forty-five pistol, knowing that it wouldn't kill it, but I could at least distract it. I now realize that I'm actually starting to trust Mark with my life, something I hadn't done in a very long time. I started hitting center mass as the creature neared ten yards from Mark. He now stopped and turned towards me. Mark took advantage of this brief pause and sprinted at the creature. I was confused by this until I saw the round thing in his hand. A grenade. I kept firing and Mark slid under the belly of the beast and plunged his hand in between the parts that made up the centaur's torso, then continuing his slide out from the other side. As he got back to his feet, he yelled, Kiava! and dove behind a nearby Cadillac. All the creature had time to do was start to look over in Mark's direction before it was obliterated by a teeth-rattling explosion. Hundreds of body parts rained down everywhere. That may have been the most badass thing I have ever seen. It's really a good thing that Mark started carrying grenades with him everywhere since the tall man incident. Cheering began erupting from all around the compound but the celebration was short-lived. As I jogged over to check on Mark, I noticed that the body parts were still moving. Not only that, but they were all moving towards the same central point. The yells of joy started dying down as more people began to realize that the thing was just putting itself back together. Just as Mark started to grab for another grenade concealed somewhere on his body, I heard the familiar voice of Sonia screaming my name. Cole, take this. The woman that lived in the tree said that you would know what to do with it. With that, she tossed me what looked like an oversized minnow catching net. That didn't make sense. There's no way in hell that this thing would even be afraid of a net like the panels were, even if it was bigger. All my doubts melted away, though, when I caught the net. Sonia was right. I knew exactly what to do. A wave of something came over me when my fingers made contact with the net. It was like an absolute certainty of something, but I wasn't sure exactly what I was certain of. I looked down at the net and realized that where the nets were on a normal minnow net, this one had medium-sized rocks. On these rocks were symbols or runes of some sort that I didn't recognize. They would have been hard to see on the rocks if they weren't glowing a bright blue color. Mark looked at me with a stare of confusion, then snapped back to reality and commanded, Get your ass in gear and use that thing. I bolted in the direction of the now half-formed doll spider and slung the nut over the wriggling mass of body parts. Nothing happened. The body parts kept moving into place and the net didn't seem to phase the thing. Well, shit. I could hear Mark say to himself from behind me. And then it hit me. It was like I remembered something that I had never even learned. Before I knew what I was doing, the word Rakulacha escaped my mouth. Immediately, all of the once blue runes changed into a deep red and smoke started rising from the net. The beast managed to get one more half of a screech in before it, well, I guess it kind of just stopped existing. While the cheering started to erupt again among the cultists, I immediately approached Sonia. Something she had said when she first approached me was hanging heavily on my mind. So, do you mind explaining why you called her the lady who lived in the trees and not the lady who lives in the trees? I said with more force than was probably necessary. Look, Cole, I, I know what you need to know. She came to me and explained everything. Yes, it's our fault that some of these beasts exist, but the shapeshifter needs to be dealt with now, and you're ready to take on that task. She came to me. Hector doesn't even know. And she was certain that you would be able to fix this. Please, just listen. 
The somber tone of the young woman's voice told me that my suspicions were true. The lady in the tree hadn't been hiding or avoiding me this whole time, and that was really hard to swallow. This was the beginning of a path to a dark place that I hadn't visited in years. I just hope that Mark is willing to come with me. There is more to this story, but this entry is getting too long, so I'm going to cut it off here and post the rest at a later date. Until then, Cole, signing off. So, where did I leave off? Oh yeah, that's right. I just found out the one person on this godforsaken plot of land that I had considered to be on my side before Mark showed up is dead. That's right, folks. The lady in the tree wasn't mad at me. She wasn't ignoring me. She'd been deceased for almost a year now. She's the one who really provided me with the means to survive over the past three years. She gave me a gun with magic bullets. She gave me hearing in an ear that had been destroyed. She gave me antidotes, alcohol. I'm pretty sure she even did my laundry once. I also can't help but think that she had something to do with the fact that the spirit preacher couldn't possess me. The most important thing she gave me, though, was her trust. Based on the few times she had directly communicated with me through letters, she had always alluded to the fact that I was supposed to be the one to help cleanse this land of the supposed darkness. Like I was the chosen one or some shit. Whether I'm actually special or not, though, she trusted me absolutely. And I failed. In her mind, I was battling these monsters and scaring them away from here. I was the hero she had been waiting on. For she couldn't fight the creatures directly due to some sort of oath. In reality... All I've done for the past three years was dick around and get lucky. I've never gone out looking to solve the monster problems around here. Even when I set the trap for Camo, that was purely selfish in reasoning. I was just annoyed by his constant attempts at trapping me. I didn't do it for the greater good of the land. Looking at my life, I've never really done much to serve anyone else but myself. Even the stuff I did after my dad was killed. I wasn't avenging him. I was getting revenge for me. I don't know why she ever decided that I was the one that would make things right. What instincts had told her that I was the man that would finally change something. I really wish she never decided on me in the first place. Because that fact alone is why as I type this in my hospital bed, my throat is hurting and my lip is trembling. Actually, that might be the hospital food's fault. Not really sure at this point. <sighs> Enough sad monologuing. Time to get back to what happened. Sonia had some explaining to do, and I fully expected to get every ounce of useful intel from her. The first question I needed answered was what the hell happened to the lady in the tree? Sonia, what happened to her? She looked at the ground. It was obvious that she was dreading having to explain this to me. She snuck into what was left of my shelter in the middle of the night after Skinny attacked the Ponderosa. She told me. At this, Mark, who seemed to materialize from nowhere, cut her off. All right, Sheila, look. I understand you want to get right to the pot where the tree lady died. But first, there is some other questions I need answers. Why did Skinny attack in the first place? And do you know where he came from? And do you know how to stop him? I turned to argue with Mark because I was the one who wanted to get to the part where she died. But unfortunately, Mark was right. Yeah, as much as I want to hear about what became of the lady in the tree, we need to start from the beginning. Now, what was that about you saying that some of these monsters popping up were your fault? I guess Mark hadn't heard that part of the previous conversation, because now he looked at me with surprise etched into his face. Sonia was even slower to answer this time. Well, um, Cole, it, it wasn't my fault per se. You know how stubborn and persistent Hector can be, right? I didn't really like where this was going, but I had a pretty good idea. 
Yeah, I mean, he tried to kill me, what, six times, I think? Without thinking, Sonya replied. Nine, but that's not what's important. What is important is that Hector has been trying to summon Cthulhu for years now. But in the last year, he's finally started having progress, sorta. Mark chimed in. What exactly does this progress consist of? The young cultist paused for a moment, deep in thought. Well, that attempts at summoning rituals started working, just not as we planned. Things were coming through the portals we created. The things weren't what we meant to summon, though. So far, we've summoned a 15-foot-tall cloaked tentacle man that's been kidnapping our brothers and sisters on a regular basis until recently. And the baby doll monster you both saw, and spirit that keeps creating minor inconveniences like broken plates and shoelaces being stolen from their respective shoes. But this last thing we summoned, and by far the most vicious, was the shapeshifter. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So, let me get this straight. You people are responsible for the tall man, the ghost preacher bitch, that baby doll abomination, and the skinny? Was there ever a point where you thought, damn, these rituals aren't really helping us out very much, and maybe we should stop? Sonia shrugged as she looked at me. This is Hector we're talking about. She had a point. Hector doesn't know when to quit. Mark decided to pipe up again. And what finally happened to convince you that these rituals were a bad idea? When the shapeshifter killed half of us, then only stopped after saying that he was going to take a nap and come back for the rest of us later. Mm, that's a pretty solid reason, I said after considering what she said. So, it was during Skinny's nap that the lady in the tree came to talk to you? Yeah, it was a few hours after the attack. The community was in absolute chaos while Hector tried to calm everyone down. I was in my shed trying to figure out what I absolutely needed to take with me when I fled. That's when I hear a woman whisper, hey, to me. It was her. I immediately knew she wasn't one of us because, well, she doesn't wear much in the way of clothes, and we're pretty strict about our dress code here. What did she want? This time, Sonia took a deep breath and closed her eyes before answering. Uh, she said that she had a way to save us from the shapeshifter, but she had a message and a few things that she needed to leave with me. After telling me this, she went back outside for a moment, and when she came back, she was carrying three large nets. She explained that the nets were for the man that lived at the hill, you, and that I was to give them to you as soon as possible. She also said she had thought of a way to keep the shapeshifter from attacking anyone again until you had a chance to deal with him. This revelation puzzled me. I knew for a fact that the lady in the tree couldn't directly attack or harm any creature as part of an oath. Mark stayed silent, deep in thought. I, on the other hand, and kept on pressing Sonia for answers. So why in the hell didn't you tell me any of this sooner? This information would have been, hang on, like... A year ago? Sonia flinched as I finished my sentence. Honestly, Cole, I was just scared that if you saw me, you would kick the shit out of me. I guess I can't blame her for that one. I did kick the shit out of Hector right in front of her a couple of years ago. Alright, alright. Did she tell you how she planned on doing this? She never got the chance to. Before she could explain any further, we heard screaming along with the sound of ripping metal outside. We rushed out to see a nine-foot-tall Ronald McDonald ripping someone in half while laughing like a madman. The Native American woman looked at me one last time and said, Make sure to tell Cole that he alone can send these beasts back using those nets. He may not know yet, but he will know what to do when the time comes. The elder spirits will guide and protect him. With that, the Indian woman took off towards the shapeshifter, which was now a giant werewolf. As she got closer, she started screaming some words I didn't understand. She also started glowing blue, which was odd. She finally got the shape. Just call him Skinny. It's catchier. Sonia seemed kind of annoyed that I interrupted her, but she continued all the same. She got Skinny's attention when she stopped five feet in front of him. She was lit up like a blue glow stick at this point. She then stopped chanting 
and was just standing in front of Skinny trying to catch her breath when Skinny said, Well, aren't you different? I've never killed a glowing one before. And proceeded to casually swipe at her with a clawed hand. The native woman didn't flinch, but when the first claw made contact with her, there was a deafening boom, accompanied by an explosion of what looked like red mist. Skinny can vaporize people? I blurted, now a little more wary of my plans to attack the entity. Sonia was quick to set me straight, though. No, 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 no. She did something to herself with those incantations. Before that point, all Skinny had done was shred people into smaller portions of people. Mark muttered in response. Probably some kiss that she set on herself as a trap so when Skinny attacked her, it would trigger. This would bypass her rule of not being able to cause direct harm to other creatures since, in a way... His skinny cursed himself by attacking her out of his own will. Did anything change about Skinny's behavior after the lady in the tree? You know. Mark slid his thumb across his throat in a slicing motion, and as he finished, he glanced over at me with what looked like pity in his eyes. Yes, um, what's your name? His look of pity quickly turned to a look of annoyance. Mark, the expert said with a growl. Yes, Mark, his behavior did change. See, after the native woman disappeared, it only took a few seconds for Skinny to regain his composure. He almost immediately started laughing. Then he said, What the hell was that? A suicide bomber attempt? Pathetic. But as he lunged to grab yet another one of my sisters, he fell to the ground in writhing agony. He got up and tried again and again, but each time he attempted to attack someone... He was met with paralyzing pain. So, the curse makes it so that Skinny can't hurt anyone? I asked apprehensively. Because six months ago, Skinny smacked the dog shit out of me, and I almost died. Not quite. See, the curse has one catch. We found out that when Marden, Cthulhu bless his soul, tried to take advantage of his inability to attack and launched an assault of his own, but when his baseball bat made contact with the creature, he was immediately struck down by a clawed hand. I slapped my palm against my forehead. Ah, that makes sense. So he can only attack if you attack first. That's why he tries to get us pissed at him. He made it seem like he was trying to lure us outside to disguise the fact that he was actually luring us into attacking him. Both Sonia and Mark looked at me somewhat startled for a moment, before Mark spoke up. Cole, pardon me, but I'm honestly used to you saying some stupid shite, but I think you're actually right this time. I started to argue, but quickly realized he was right. Screw you, Mark. So, do I kill or banish Skinny and by tossing one of those nets on him and yelling whatever magic words come into my head? Wait, how the actual hell do I know what magic words to use? Sonia answered me with, Yeah, I don't really understand that either, but let's just roll with it. Just then I heard Mark say, What the fuck? From right behind me. This was odd, since Mark had been standing in front of me for a few minutes now. I turned around, and sure enough, there was a second Mark behind me. This meant that either Skinny just walked up pretending to be Mark, or even worse, he'd been talking to us the whole time, and now knew everything that we knew. Sonia and I backed away from the marks as they stared at each other in confusion, and then back at me. The mark on the left yelled, Throw the net on it! Now's your chance to end him! And the other fires back, Oh, no, he's trying to trick you! Throw it on him! Fast! After a moment of thought, I said, uh, oh, Okay, okay, so I think I have a way to figure this out. Whichever one of you is the real Mark just has to punch the other Mark to prove you can attack first. Both Marks shouted, But then he'll kill me. At this, Sonya whispered in my ear, Damn, he's good. But I already had known what my next move was. Sonya, give me one of those nets. As she handed me one of the nets that was laying on the ground next to her, I started walking towards Mark until I was right in front of them. A wicked grin spread across my face as I said, All right, here's a question that only the real Mark would know the answer to. How did I get the tall man to run away? 
The mark on the left quickly responded. Yeah, you cut off a tentacle, uh, but couldn't Skinny have seen that? I now looked at Mark on the right to see how he planned to respond to the situation. All he did was squint his eyes at me and sigh. Then, in a defeated tone, say, <sighs> You took off your clothes and ran at him naked until he fled. And satisfied by his answer, I slung the net over the top of the leftmost Mark's head and yelled the new magic words, Ekalaha Chalarika. Not really sure why the magic words came out of my mouth were so different from the ones that came out when I got rid of the baby doll monster, but like Sonia said, I guess we just roll with it. As the runes that were carved into the rocks that outlined the net started to glow red, and Skinny was swallowed by the smoke, I heard him utter, No fucking way. In a deep voice, then, as the smoke that swallowed him was blown away by a breeze, he was gone. Pretty anticlimactic, right? I was honestly kind of hoping for some badass battle where we fought to the death and I got to stab him with a magic wooden spear that was like a final gift from the lady in the tree or something while saying something really cool. But in the end, Skinny was defeated by an immature inside joke. That's it. I mean, yeah, the tall man's out there somewhere, but Skinny is done. The lady in the tree got her wish. That's all I could really hope to accomplish. Mark was pretty pissed off at me for putting his life on the line and risking sending him to another dimension on the basis of him remembering an inside joke, but whatever. In response to his anger, I just told him that I had faith in him and in the end, that's all that mattered. All he said in return was, ah, Fuck you, mate. Oh, I need a beer. I didn't tell him how I had really figured out who was real when they both said, but then he'll kill me in unison. You see, the new Mark that had just walked out shouldn't have known the rules of the curse since he hadn't been there to hear about them. All I can figure is that Skinny had probably been listening in, disguised as a cultist, and decided to enter the conversation and stop us before we came up with the plan to kill him. I really just wanted Mark to believe that I was dumb enough to put his life on the line for something that Skinny could have easily heard when he had been eavesdropping at the right time. It serves him right for basically calling me a dumbass earlier. After Skinny was dealt with, Mark and I shared an uncomfortable couple of goodbyes with the cultists, most of whom hadn't even noticed what had happened, including Hector, much less appreciated the fact that we had just got rid of the most single vile creature that had ever inhabited this land. But I was okay with that. The fact that the lady in the tree's killer was gone for good was good enough for me. Some of you are probably asking, wait, if that's all that happened, then why were they both in the hospital? Well, that actually happened when the headquarters of the monster hunting organization that Mark works for summoned both of us to be interrogated about the event that led to the destruction of Skinny whom they knew to be an extremely high-level threat. After all the paperwork and questioning was over with, Mark offered to take me out for a drink. I accepted. Long story short, don't drink and drive, kids. They even took up our electronics for the first week we were in here. And claimed it was so they could scan them, or, but I knew it was just punishment for damaging a company-armored SUV. Anyways... That's pretty much it for now. I'll try to keep posting, but now that Skinny is gone, the land seems a lot more... relaxed. I hope you all enjoyed the tale of how I finally killed Skinny. This is Cole, signing off.